when did you first get excited about science and engineering and get involved? Mm, oh, look, I mean, you know, from very sort of, you know, early days when you're sort of looking at the world around you and you perhaps don't even realise that formally it's called science and it's called engineering, but there's always a bit of that curiosity. And when you find yourself asking all those questions and sometimes kind of having that conversation to yourself and you're going, wow, this is so cool. I wonder if I could do this. I think when you sort of get into that mode, you know that you've got that innate excitement about science and that passion for science. And then someone tells you what you're really asking is really important. And you go, oh, this matters. And when did that happen for you? Like, was that about sustainability right from the beginning as well? You know, I think, I think from the early stages, you know, one of the things that I was always very conscious of is that, you know, if the planet has to be a place that is fair and equitable for everyone on this planet, um, then we've got to ask whether science can actually deliver those outcomes for everyone on this planet. You know, can we actually have science and technology and engineering and all of these things that address the needs of everybody on this planet? And I think to me, you know, sometimes when you look at the world around you, you, you do realize that, you know, we have a long way to go in achieving goals of sustainability. But I think at that early stage in your life, you don't know it's called sustainability. You just know that something inside you tells you that, you know, you want to do something. Well, for you, it was called rubbish, wasn't it? <laughs> wasn't it about like looking at rubbish? And yes. How did rubbish and equality and sustainability all come together? For me, sustainability and equity was almost sort of part of that same thinking in my head. Even though at that stage in my life, I didn't necessarily know the word sustainability. But I think what I was able to see is that if you've got people who want to be able to have the basics, you know, clothes, roof over your head, you know, basically something to eat every day, all of those basic human rights, how are you going to actually deliver that in a way that even people who might not earn enough income, how are people going to provide for their families? And I think this is where, in my own head, thinking about sustainability and thinking about what it means from an equity point of view so that everyone's needs are being fulfilled. Because you're actually observing how materials were being made sustainable and recycled in India by mm. the sort of more impoverished class really yes. but how they were part of that process. Yes absolutely and even even that whole process of where you know you do have people who are your waste warriors you know, your everyday waste warriors who'd be able to collect little glass bottles, you know, medicine bottles and, and be able to make money out of that. And I think to me, there was also that underpinning excitement about the fact that there could well be potentially an economy that could be built around all these materials that somebody else didn't need. So I found that really exciting. The fact that you could potentially create livelihoods for people out of waste resources. And I think suddenly in there, the notion of equity became so much real. So for you, I mean, you've had so much success over the last few years and you're being really recognised as that. What, what are you the most proud of that you've done, do you think? The fact that, you know, we started our journey many, many years ago thinking about the steel industry. And we talked about, at that stage, the concept of green steel and, and the fact that green steel could indeed use waste materials like waste tires in the process of making steel. Uh, I think in the early days, the concept was so kind of shocking to a lot of people because it was almost this notion that, well, how can you use waste tires to make a quality product like steel? And I think it almost sort of felt quite contradictory that using waste resources to make a quality product. And I think I'm, I'm really in a way proud about the fact that we've not only shown that the science has worked, but the impact of that science globally is now being felt. The fact that our green steel technology has been commercialized and is being used in different parts of the world goes to show that, you know, what we thought about was in a way that early stage of thought bubble, um, as you do, has actually come to life. That fantasy has become a reality. Yes. I mean, did it feel like a fantasy or was it always for you something that was, you were always working within the possible? Um, you know what? <laughs> it's always been every time I come up with an idea it always seems like a fantasy to me right. because I think in a way sometimes I, I remind myself 
that, no, no, I've got to work a lot harder to crack this problem and to be able to really achieve those goals and to deliver real world solutions. It's not good enough for it to be a thought bubble in my head. So, so every time, you know, the fantasy comes into my head space, it's almost one of those things where I lay awake thinking, but how am I going to make this into reality? <laughs> is that where it starts? Like, is that where, because there's so much creativity involved in science, which a lot of people don't really think about. So for you, where does those creative thoughts come from? Do they come while you're working? in the laboratory or working with materials or do they come when you're in bed and relaxed and resting, which I'm not sure you probably do much of. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, uh, usually it's the, the resting and the relaxation is is not a word in, in my vocabulary you don't do it. at all. You I, don't know that. I, 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 I don't do that very well. I don't rest very well. Um, I think I'd probably drive myself crazy if I sat down to rest, you know. So <laughs> um, so for me, it's, it's really one of those things where I'm actually probably the busiest. I'm running around, I'm doing things, and suddenly it's almost like I get into this other headspace where my physical body is doing things, but in my headspace, I've got all these thoughts, I'm somewhere else, and I'm lost in my own space, which I really love that. I love the fact that I can, I can kind of do that, almost kind of detach myself from myself and go, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought about that. I need to so do this. and and. I almost enjoy that process to the point where the harder the thought is, the more challenging it is, and the more I get excited about it. And I, I want to be able to prove it to myself. In your life, have you had people that who have been the most influential of you because they've shown you the possibilities or because they've said, no, you can't do that? <laughs> or is it all about for you just that kind of idea, I've got to do that for myself. Usually the motivation has come from the fact that people have often said, no, you can never do that. Uh, and I've got to usually go, you know, I know I can do it. I've thought about it. This is a creative idea. I just have to work my way through all the science, the underpinning science, the technology, and how am I going to bring this to life? And I think even when those steps in my head are bubbling away, I know somewhere on that journey, I've proven it to myself. You know, it could well be that thought experiment. And I think, I think the fact that I can have that conversation with someone who basically, you know, wants to be able to say, oh no, but this is not possible. That gets me even more excited. <laughs> Don't tell you not. It. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what I also find interesting is, you know, you've got science, you're about sustainability, you're into rubbish and all that kind of thing, but you recently did a Vogue shoot for Vogue magazine fashion. How did you enjoy that? process and that outcome. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The Vogue shoot. Um, oh my gosh. I, I have to tell you that was, that was incredibly funny because again, I'm the sort of person who, you know, I, as I was, you know, kind of thinking to myself, I was going, what was it that uh, I enjoyed about it was the fact that I could just kind of go crazy and go wild. And, and I think in fact, the, the, the final sort of picture that ended up in the Vogue magazine, I'm trying to think to myself, was the one that I was kind of the least prepared for because it was one of those things where I was, I just sort of thought I was mucking around. And the next minute, you know, it's, it's the picture that ended up in Vogue because I had my safety glasses and I, you know, I, I just remember I was mucking around because I'd hurt my thumb and I was sort of standing around trying to hide my hand because I had this massive bandaid on my thumb and everything. And I'm going, okay, I better hide this. You guys don't know. No imperfections this. allowed on Vogue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so it was, it was, it was cool. It was fun. Well, science is now sexy, which is also a good thing, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Why not? All right. Let's do the speed round. Okay. You ready for this? Totally. Okay. Speed round. What's on your playlist at the moment? I'm looking at solving all kinds of really nasty, nasty questions on this planet. I want to be able to really figure out how we're going to be able to create rare earths out of waste. And I think I'm really excited about right. that. Right. So that's on your music playlist. Yes. <laughs> that's my music. I don't okay. sit down and listen to music. I, I never do You that. listen to information about rare earths. I just sit there and I read stuff. And in my head, it is like music. I go, this is, this is so relaxing because I never get to kind of find the answer and relax. And if I can actually do all of that in my own headspace, I am so happy. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Uh, do you get time to read books? 
do you have a raise? <laughs> or is it all, that's, that's you reading rare earth material that, as well? That's, that's me reading, you know, but, but I do love to read about, you know, I was traveling um, to, to um, Singapore and India and New Zealand recently. And, and I, I just love the fact that there was a magazine that talked about how communities in India who have been cooking in the old fashioned way inside their homes are now being helped by so many social groups to be able to reduce you know, pollution inside homes. So I love to read about how people are doing so many inspiring things. Okay. What was your favorite subject at school? <gasps> oh my gosh, I tell you what, let me start with the one I hated the most. I hated physical education. <laughs> I just so totally hated it. It's yeah. like, don't tell me to walk there. Don't tell me to run there. I, I don't want to listen to you because I hate this stuff. But on the other hand, I really totally loved chemistry and maths because for me it was like all of this stuff that I just, I just sort of felt like I could actually have a conversation and, and get other people excited about it. It made um, sense to you right from the beginning. Absolutely. What's your earliest memory? You know, the earliest memory of me was on those little two-wheeler scooters. And if you can picture crazy traffic, Mumbai, my father and mother on this little two-wheeler scooter, that is like totally not safe. And I just remember standing right in the front um, and I, I still know that there's a picture of me standing right in the front of that. Oh, and little, your mom and dad are on the back. And, and my mom and dad, standing, yeah. and I'm sort of there. And I'm going, this is so fun. Can we do more? And totally, totally loving the fact that there was dirt and gringe and wind blowing. And, you know, and I think, you know, How are we? <laughs> you know what? I, I think I might have been less than three. I might have been less than three. I think because I just remember from my sort of memory of how short I was standing in the front. Because, of course, my dad had to see over my head when he was riding. Waving amongst the crazy <laughs> traffic. All right. Do you have a guilty pleasure? I love eating ice cream late in the night because I just feel like, oh my gosh, I could just stand there with a tub of my ice cream. And even my memory of, a, of being a student, I remember when I was a PhD student in Michigan, all my friends would just, you know, bring me ice cream in a massive dinner plate and go, forget dinner, <laughs> this is food, because they all knew how much I loved it. There are some habits that never die. All right. That's what is interesting to me. What keeps fueling you basically is ice cream. Totally. And science. Yes. And sustainability. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for today. It's been great to chat. Thank you so much, Sarah.